Once upon a time, a special ball landed on Earth. It could change its shape to learn new things. It first landed by some rocks and turned into a rock itself. After a long time, snow started falling. A hurt and tired wolf came by and died next to the rock ball. The ball changed again, this time into the hurt wolf. It even felt the pain of the injury, but luckily, the ball could heal quickly. It learned to walk like a wolf and even followed the path the wolf was on. The ball wolf walked for a long time until it reached a place with broken houses. There, a lonely boy lived by himself. The boy thought the ball wolf was his old pet wolf come back to life. This was the ball's first meeting with a human. Inside the house, the ball learned even more. It felt the warmth of the fire, heard new sounds, and smelled new smells. The next day, the boy talked to the ball wolf about how he wished he could have joined his family when they left to find a better home. He also mentioned a special place with delicious fruits. After catching a fish for dinner, the boy ate it, showing the ball how to find food. Finally, the boy looked at drawings on the wall, pictures of his family and friends so he wouldn't forget them. Our boy hero, bless his heart, decided to play explorer. His people vanished, leaving him with some serious wanderlust. So, off he trotted, determined to find them. Now, you'd think he'd pack some essentials for this trek, right? Nope. Not our guy. Luckily, he stumbled upon a helpful rock with an arrow, pointing him in the maybe they went this way direction. Feeling like a real cartographer, he marched on, finding more encouraging arrows. Days, however, turned into a frosty nightmare. Food vanished faster than his good mood, and his body grew colder by the minute. To top it all off, he took a spectacular tumble on some ice. Soaking wet, scratched up, and probably shivering like a chihuahua in a blizzard, he soldiered on. Did we mention there was a wolf silently observing this whole ordeal? Probably not judging, just offering some quality silent companionship. By this point, weakness had become his best friend, and his injury decided to throw a raging infection party. Then, fate dealt him a cruel hand. A marked rock, unlike the others, screamed, turn back, you fool. With a giant scratch. Guess what was around it? Carts and tombstones. Yep, his people were pushing up daisies. Reality punched him square in the face. Here he was, weak, lonely, and chatting with a non-responsive wolf. A strange sense of gratitude washed over him for the silent wolf bro, even though it couldn't hold a decent conversation. Dragging himself back home, defeated and looking like death warmed over, he clung to a sliver of hope. Patch himself up, he thought, and he'd be back on that find people mission. Famous last words. His wound mocked him, getting worse by the hour, and a fever decided to join the party. Despite being a walking medical emergency, he held on to the desperate hope of finding other humans. Finally accepting his fate, he said a tearful goodbye to the wolf, begging it to not forget him. Then, with a dramatic sigh, he kicked the bucket. But hey, at least his spirit got a reunion with his family. Now, the sphere, all charged up from the boy's experiences, decided to become human. Adventure awaited. Except, being human is trickier than it looks. Apparently, the sphere forgot the whole eating and sleeping thing. Oops. Instant death. But wait. It regenerated. This hilarious cycle of death and rebirth became its new hobby. Each death made it a faster learner, and soon it found itself in a warm, inviting place. There, it met, a giant bear. Not exactly the welcoming committee it was hoping for, Sphere Boy. In the quaint village of Nainana, a bright-eyed girl named March practices mothering her pretend baby. Her friend Perona bursts in, eager to join their game, but Perona's parents arrive with her younger sister in tow. Back home, March asks her parents when she can finally grow up and be a real mother. With only her, her sister, and one other girl playing pretend mothers, March feels impatient to care for her own little one. Her parents gently explain she must wait to become an adult. Later, March is back to her motherly duties when a booming bell shatters their play. Perona whisks her away for a game in the woods, but Hyacy, a stern-looking man, intercepts them. We learn Perona was actually trying, unsuccessfully, to whisk March away. The entire village gathers as a revered shaman from the Yenon people prepares to choose one of three children for a sacrifice to the god, Anagoma. After a careful examination, March is chosen. Everyone congratulates her, yet the innocent girl remains clueless about the true meaning. Arriving home, March is confused by her parents' tears. Hyacy enters and explains her responsibility to fulfill the sacrifice as expected. After a celebratory feast, she and Hyacy's men will leave for a mountain where she'll be put to sleep, offered as a sacrifice to Anagoma. In a year, they'll return to retrieve her remains for the family. March's heart sinks. Why must she die? 
Her dream of becoming a mother, now impossible. But she also understands, if she doesn't go, her sister or Perona will face the same fate. With a heavy heart, she endures the celebratory meal and embarks on the journey to the Mountain of Sacrifice. Suddenly, an arrow whizzes through the air, causing a commotion. March seizes the opportunity and stumbles through the forest, a desperate escape attempt. She runs with all her might, tripping and tumbling until she lands with a splash in a lake. There, she stumbles upon a sight both horrifying and fascinating, an eyeball. An enormous eye belonging to a sphere-like creature whose body lay in pieces, regenerating in a bizarre and unsettling way, terrifying the soldiers chasing March. Though scared, March lingers long enough to witness the creature forming a human body. Left with nowhere to go, the newly formed boy follows her. Back in the village, Perona, the arrow shooter, is apprehended. Hyacy realizes her plan, saving March and faking his own demise. Soldiers return, claiming to have witnessed a monster. Meanwhile, March tries to communicate with the bewildered boy, but he seems completely lost. She spies a fruit the boy seems drawn to and, with her nimble climbing skills, reaches high and pulls down several fruits. The boy devours them all in a bestial manner. March tries to show him how to properly eat and express gratitude, attempting to instill some basic manners. Failing to elicit any response, the boy simply lies down to sleep. March, with nothing else to do, munches on a fruit and drifts off to sleep as well. A dream unfolds. March reunites with her happy parents, everything perfect. But then, she sees other children, the previous sacrifices, appearing sad and accusing. Guilt washes over her, and she wakes with a jolt. Leaving the sleeping boy behind, she walks away. But upon waking, he misses her and sets off after her, determined to follow. In a moment of selflessness, March decides to take on the role of mother, teaching the boy right from wrong and giving him a name, Fushur, meaning immortal. Perona sees her chance. While the guard isn't looking, she uses a hidden knife to cut her ropes. Suddenly, the earth starts shaking. It's the giant bear, the same one that killed Fushur. This bear is actually Anaguma, the creature they offer sacrifices to. The soldiers shoot arrows at him, but they bounce right off. Anaguma swats one soldier away, and the other runs for his life, leaving Perona tied up all alone. Perona struggles to free herself and barely makes it, she tumbles over a cliff but manages to grab a ledge at the bottom. Meanwhile, Hyacy finds March. Knowing there's no escape, March says goodbye to Fushur and goes with Hyacy for the sacrifice. They give her something to sleep and put her on a mountaintop as an offering to Anaguma. Just before they leave, March faints. The bear arrives at the same time as Perona, who races up the mountain to save March. The soldiers try to stop the bear, but Hyacy leaves them both behind, hoping for two sacrifices. Just then, Fusha arrives too. He gets locked up with Anaguma, the girls, and the soldiers. Hyacy watches in shock as the still-living bear attacks Fusha, who turns into a wolf and fights back fiercely. Anaguma can't defeat the wolf. When March wakes up, Anaguma is already dead. Hyacy offers March and Perona a choice, live in her homeland or die. She asks the soldiers to take the bear and the wolf with them, even though everyone is scared of Fushur. March, in her innocence, throws a fruit to the wolf. And in a strange voice, Fushur speaks his first word, thank you. On the way to the new village, Perona dreams of her childhood. Her sister once hid her from the ritual, but when Perona came out, her sister was already gone, sacrificed. The next day, March enjoys feeding the wolf, who thanks her again. They see the old woman who chose March for the sacrifice. The woman explains that her people don't believe in the ritual, they use it to trick another tribe into thinking the land has riches. Perona, already disgusted by the ritual, becomes even more determined to stop it. Everyone stops to bathe in a lake. Here, Fushur sees his wolf reflection and remembers the boy who cared for him and wanted to be remembered. This memory turns Fushur back into the boy again. March is thrilled. She recognizes Fushur and they're both overjoyed to see each other again. After traveling for a while, they finally reach Yanom village. March is wide-eyed with wonder, taking in all the sights and sounds of this new place. But then, a wave of sadness washes over her as she remembers her parents and how much she misses them. Suddenly, March sees someone delivering letters. This gives her an idea, she wants to send a message to her parents. But there's a hitch, her nine Anna people don't write. So, her parents wouldn't be able to read a letter. Determined, March dips her hand in ink and presses it on the paper, explaining that this means Mark is okay. Unfortunately, neither she nor Perona can tell the delivery guy where her parents live. Yanom is huge, and without an address, delivering the letter would be impossible. 
Still not giving up, Perona decides to keep the special hand-printed message and find a way to deliver it to March's parents. After a delicious meal, things take a turn for the worse. Hyacinth's true plan is revealed, she never intended to let them lie freely. Everyone falls asleep mysteriously, and Fusher wakes up to find himself locked in a cell. Hayasi offers freedom to prisoners if they kill Fusher, but he's impossible to defeat because he keeps coming back to life. This attack awakens a new power in Fusher. He gets stabbed with a spear, but instead of dying, he heals up instantly. Not only that, but he creates a brand new spear that looks just like the one used on him. Fusher uses this new weapon to fight back against the attacker and escapes. However, he's quickly recaptured by soldiers and thrown into the same cell as March, who just woke up. March sees Fusher is hurt and acts like a caring friend. She carefully removes the arrow that was stuck in him when he was a wolf. Then, she hears a voice from above, it's Perona, locked in another cell. She asks March to hand over the arrow. March passes the arrow to Fusher. He digs a hole, and guess what he finds? It's Anagoma's buried body, riddled with arrows. March feels sorry for the poor animal. Hayasi shows up, complaining that someone needs to take care of the dead bear, but everyone's too scared. Then, she sees March and decides to dump this responsibility on her. So, for a while, March is stuck cleaning the dead bear's wounds, while Perona secretly plans her escape. With the help of an old prisoner, Perona disguises herself as a soldier. She manages to escape with everyone else, taking some of the bear's remains as proof to her village that the rituals are unnecessary. After a long journey, Perona finally tries to put her plan into action. She climbs some dangerous rocks, but loses her grip and falls. A soldier finds her and tries to take advantage, but Perona is tough. She knocks him out and continues her mission, still disguised as a soldier. She joins March and everyone else, and leads them to a hidden sewer exit near the bear's body. Confused, March starts to follow, but then sees Perona about to stab the dead bear with her sword. March is furious. She can't believe how cruel everyone has been to the poor animal. Even though Perona argues that destroying the bear will end the rituals, March insists that they should at least respect the creature's body in death. Perona finally gives in. After much arguing, she respects March's wish and leaves the bear's body untouched. Now, she faces a new challenge, how can she convince her people to stop the gruesome rituals without harming the sacred creature? They scramble into a wagon, desperately trying to outrun the soldiers hot on their heels. March, blissfully unaware of the danger, is filled with excitement at the thought of reuniting with her parents. Lost in her daydreams, she doesn't even notice Perona dodging a flurry of arrows. Suddenly, Hyacinth's voice booms from behind, offering them a deal. If they abandon Fusher, she'll let them go free. Perona, stubborn as ever, refuses. This act of defiance only fuels the attacks, raining arrows down upon them. March, her kind heart unable to bear seeing her friend hurt, jumps out of the wagon to help. Tragically, her selfless act backfires. An arrow pierces her innocent body, saving Perona's life in the process. Enraged by the sight, he changes into the mighty bear, his fury unleashed as he attacks the soldiers with a vengeance. Perona, overcome with grief, desperately tries to save March, but it's too late. March, sensing the end is near, whispers a final request to Perona. With her last breath, she asks Perona to fulfill her dream of becoming a mother, a dream they once shared. And then, with a gentle sigh, March's spirit leaves this world. Grief-stricken, Perona cradles March's body. Jumping out of the wagon, she explains to Fusher, now back in his boy form, that he needn't have fought anymore. Hyasi, severely injured from the battle, appears on the scene. March finds herself in a dreamlike state. Here, she reunites with her parents, a picture-perfect image of a happy family. She sees herself all grown up, holding a child, the doll she cherished so dearly. But the happiness fades as she recalls Fusher. A chilling realization dawns upon her. She wasn't an adult, but the spirit of a child who had just passed away. Facing her next surprise, she encounters the bear spirit. Before her eyes, the scene unfolds, Fusher and Perona appear, with Perona on the verge of taking her own life to join March in the afterlife. Desperate to stop her friend from making this terrible mistake, March reaches out, but as a spirit, she has no power to intervene. Sensing Perona's despair, Fusher transforms back into the bear and whisks her away from the soldiers. Perona finally understands. Even after losing March, Fusher wants her to live on. Exhausted and heartbroken, Perona arrives at her village riding atop Fusher, still in the bear form. Tears streaming down her face, she presents March's letter with the handprint to her parents. 
Unable to decipher the drawing, they look to Perona for an explanation. With a choked voice, she translates March's message, I'm okay. Their daughter may have survived the sacrifice, but she was gone. Their hearts shatter as they thank Perona for everything she's done. Just as Fusha reverts to his boy form, sending shivers down everyone's spine, a villager rushes in with an urgent message, the Yanom people are approaching. Perona yells at Fusha to ditch her and escape. Poof! Fusha turns into a wolf and zooms off into the woods. Meanwhile, Perona tries to take down Hyacy with an arrow, but ends up with a sore hand for her troubles. Fusha is on a quest for new experiences, feeling a bit more human now. He spends most of his time as a wolf, but sometimes turns into a boy for no reason at all. Other times, he transforms into March just to climb trees, handy trick. Guess who he bumps into? Pyron, the lady who was still chilling in the wagon they escaped in. Pyron mistakes Fusher for a resurrected March, but quickly realizes it's just our furry friend. With no other options, Pyron tags along with Fusher. Starving, Pyron tries to take a bite out of Fusher. Big mistake! Fusher, not a fan of being a chew toy, climbs a tree as March and pelts Pyron with fruit until she's full. Later, Pyron grabs some paper and starts scribbling, which totally intrigues Fusher. She starts teaching him words, one by one. Time flies as they travel together, and Fusher's vocabulary keeps growing. One day, on a ship, Fusher can even speak a few sentences. He tells Pyron a story about a shapeshifting boy who took care of him in the beginning, wonder who that could be? At night, they rest in the forest before continuing their journey to Pyron's house. They both doze off under the stars, ready to hit the road again in the morning. Suddenly, a weird tree monster attacks Fusher and snuffs him out. Even worse, it steals his boy form. Hold on! Fusher's creator pops in and freezes time to explain. Apparently, this tree monster named Knocker is Fusher's enemy. It steals his experiences and memories along with the forms he uses. But Knocker has a weak spot, a core in its middle. Nasty! Fusher has to rip it out to win. Furious, Fusher attacks Knocker with everything he's got. But no matter how close he gets, Knocker keeps stealing his forms, leaving him only with March's appearance. Luckily, March was a good climber. Using her agility, Fusha reaches Knocker's core and destroys it just in the nick of time. However, this also brings back his memories and all the forms he collected. Fusha's creator explains that Fusha's job is to protect this world, while Knocker's job is to, well, wreck it. With a cryptic goodbye, the creator disappears, promising to return someday. Pyron and Fusha, back on track, finally reach Pyron's boyfriend's house. There, they meet Gugu, a shy boy with a mask. We get a glimpse into Gugu's life, he and his brother are working hard to save up for a better life. One day, Gugu spots a girl named Reen who keeps walking by. Let's just say he has a bit of a crush, even though they haven't spoken. Gugu finishes a tough day's work and sees his brother talking to strangers. The brother quickly leaves without saying goodbye. Gugu counts his money, his daily earnings and his saved up cash. But wait! Some money is missing. He asks his brother about it but his brother denies knowing anything. Not wanting to risk losing more, Gugu hides the remaining money in a new spot. He offers his brother a muffin, but the brother refuses. Feeling a little lonely, Gugu sits down to eat when a stray puppy wanders up. Gugu shares his food with the cute little dog. The next day, Gugu bumps into the same puppy again. He bumps into the woman who recognized him, and guess what? She's thrilled to see her furry friend. Overflowing with gratitude, she gives Gugu a super valuable ring. She tells him that if he could sell it, he'd never have to work another day in his life. Excited, Gugu rushes home to tell his brother, but finds the place empty. His brother took all the money and disappeared. Alone again, Gugu keeps walking until he bumps into a man carrying a huge log. One of the logs almost rolls off and hits him. The worried man runs for help, leaving Gugu alone. Suddenly, the log starts to move. Gugu sees a girl trapped below, right in the path of the rolling log. He dives in to save her, pushing her out of the way. It's Reen, the girl he likes. But even though he's a hero, the log ends up falling on him instead. People rush over and save Reen, but they leave Gugu injured and alone. Later, an old man finds Gugu and saves him. When Gugu wakes up, he's changed. His face is badly hurt, making him feel like a monster. He has to wear a mask to hide from everyone. Three months pass, and then Hiran and Fusha arrive. Gugu shows them around his new job, a liquor store. He teaches Fusha all about running the store, and they start to see each other as brothers since they both feel like outsiders. One day, Reen walks into the store. 
She's looking for something to heal an old wound on her arm, the same wound she got when Gugu saved her three months ago. Gugu is excited to talk to her, but sadly, she seems more interested in Fusher. Feeling a little down, Gugu decides to get in better shape, hoping to become more attractive. Gugu asks Fusher to show him some of his cool abilities. He remembers making a spear in jail and decides to try making one with his bare hands. Then, Gugu starts doing experiments on Fusher. He hurts Fusher to test his healing powers and see what happens. He also discovers that Fusher can actually copy any object that hurts him. Gugu hurts even though he heals fast. Nobody likes pain, not even a science experiment. Reen wants a job at the store too, so she moves in the next day. Gugu wants to heal her old wound and asks the old man for help. The old man uses strong liquor from the store on Reen's arm. Gugu freaks out, why is there liquor inside him? The old man admits he experimented while healing Gugu, adding liquor to his body. Angry, Gugu storms off. Reen finds out and asks the old man to apologize, but he refuses. She wants Fusher to find Gugu, but Fusher is still upset and says no. He takes over Gugu's chores, but Fusher is a terrible cook, everyone misses Gugu's food. Gugu tries everything to get the liquor out, but nothing works. He decides to work hard and pay a doctor to remove it. Back in his shack, Gugu needs a new job, but everyone calls him a monster because of his mask. Tired of it, Gugu throws the mask away. People are even more scared of his face now and treat him like a freak at the circus. Back at the store, everyone misses Gugu. Pyron convinces Fusher to check on Gugu. Broke, Gugu remembers the ring Rin gave him. But he can't sell it, it's one good memory he has left. Suddenly, Gugu sees his brother, passed out and skinny in an alley. It's the same brother who abandoned him. Gugu leaves the ring with his brother, thinking it could change his life. But Gugu's bad luck continues. While sleeping, some men kidnap him to make money by showing his face. Just in time, Fusher shows up as a bear and scares the men away. Fusher wants to become an adult and needs Gugu's help. Gugu is happy, he and Fusher can scare away the bullies together, just like brothers. Fusher finally asks Gugu if he wants to go back to the store, but Gugu refuses because he's still mad at the old man. Fusher takes Gugu to his tent and discovers a cool new power. After a yummy snack, Gugu tells his story. He used to live comfortably with his parents, sisters, and brother. But when his dad got a new job, Gugu realized it wasn't his real family, they were just paying him and his brother to work. So, the two brothers were left alone to find new jobs. Suddenly, Reen shows up begging Gugu to come back to the store. Everyone misses him. But Gugu hides, ashamed of his face without a mask. Fusher offers to find Gugu's old mask, leaving them alone. Reen discovers Gugu's hiding and shows him her own wound, the one from the accident. Gugu's disgusted though, her tiny scar is nothing compared to his messed up face. Reen explains her own pain. Her parents are super controlling, like she's their pet, and her arm scar is because of them. If it wasn't for them, she wouldn't be hurt. She thinks whoever pushed her off a cliff hated her parents. Gugu won't tell her about his accident, afraid she'll hate him. Reen respects his decision and gives him a new mask to feel better. They set off together to find Fusher. Meanwhile, Fusher finds Gugu's mask just as his creator warns him about his enemy who's always looking for trouble. Suddenly, a man grabs Reen. It turns out her parents hired him to take her back home. Gugu saves her, and they run away together. Reen explains she ran away to escape her controlling parents and made the mask Gugu gave her to hide. Gugu throws away his new mask just as Fusher arrives with the old one. He decides to return to the store with them, but on their way back, a maid from Reen's family recognizes her. They flee into the forest to avoid capture. To slow the maid down, Fusher transforms into March, pretending to be a hurt little girl. Unfortunately, his enemy sees this as an opportunity to attack. Confused, Gugu and Reen go back to find Fusher wounded. Knocker, the enemy, is there in the form of March. The creature attacks Gugu, but Fusher defends him and fights back. Gugu tries to fight, but gets tossed aside. Worried about him, Fusher gets distracted and loses his human form. Gugu falls and throws up the booze he drank. The vomit touches a torch, causing a fire. He wants to use the fire to attack the enemy, but it's gone when he returns. Feeling dizzy from the booze, Gugu stumbles back to the store for more. But Reen's parents are there, taking her away. Gugu begs the old man for more booze, explaining he needs to save Fusher. Pyron understands and fills him up. Drunk Gugu confronts Reen's parents. They reveal they found her and are taking her home to marry someone they chose. Gugu drunkenly declares he doesn't care who her fiancé is, because no one loves her more than him. 
He rushes back to the forest to find Fusher, but only sees the enemy disguised as a bear. Worried, Gugu sets the creature on fire, confusing everyone at the store. Finally defeating the enemy, Gugu cries for Fusher. He sees a light enter a stone, it's Fusher, now just a wolf. Gugu picks up the stone, and his creator appears. Fusher is revived in his wolf form, and they celebrate their victory with a happy roll. In the morning, everyone eats breakfast together. Fusher goes for water and meets his creator again. The creator warns him to leave, or he'll get weak and the enemy will attack again. But Fusher refuses, wanting to stay with Gugu. Back inside, Reen decides to return home and says goodbye. For years later, Gugu is all grown up and muscular. Reen visits the store, showing she keeps in touch. Fusher has grown up too, learning how to be human. Reen's 16th birthday approaches, and she reveals she's marrying a stranger. Fusher mentions Gugu likes her. She goes to talk to Gugu, who's talking to a stranger, his brother. Gugu's brother explains he has a better job now and offers Gugu a place to live. But Gugu remembers being abandoned and refuses. He has a family now with the old people, Reen, and Fusher. Gugu's brother apologizes, and everyone watches as Gugu chooses his new family. The man rushes into the store, asking the old man for the ring Gugu gave him. Suddenly, Rin recognizes it, the very same ring her father gave her years ago. A memory flashes, reminding her of a boy she met and gave the ring to. It dawns on her, it's Gugu. Overcome with emotion, she approaches him and asks if he truly liked her back then. Gugu, flustered and caught off guard, stammers a denial, leaving Rin heartbroken and confused. Just then, the old man arrives with a surprise for Gugu, a brand new mask. This one's tougher, even shooting fire to ward off any potential threats like the knocker creature. With excitement, Gugu and Fusher head off to Rin's birthday party. Watching Gugu all grown up, the old man can't hold back his tears, Gugu's practically like his own grandson now. Arriving at the grand mansion, Fusher awkwardly presents Rin with some vegetables. Gugu, meanwhile, offers a single purple flower, the very same blossom that captivated Rin on the fateful day of their accident. Whispers and stares follow Gugu's choice, everyone assuming it would only bring back painful memories for Rin. But to everyone's surprise, Rin beams with joy, cherishing this token from Gugu. The party buzzes with questions about Gugu's masked appearance. Meanwhile, Rin is introduced to her future fiancé. Witnessing his love interest with another man, Gugu's heart sinks. Unable to bear the sight, he decides to slip away unnoticed. Sensing his departure, Rin rushes after him, determined to get answers. She pleads with him, begging him to finally reveal the truth about his accident. Gugu hesitates, then confesses, he fell off a cliff trying to save someone. A log struck him, but he managed to save the girl, who thankfully only suffered a minor scratch on her arm. Rin's breath catches, the realization hits her like a bolt of lightning. She's the girl! Tears well up in her eyes, but before Gugu can explain further, the ground trembles violently, splitting open beneath their feet. Fusher's creator appears, delivering horrifying news, the enemy, the knocker, has returned. Chaos erupts as the entire mansion begins to crumble. Fusher, quick thinking, yells for everyone to flee. With a mighty roar, he transforms into a giant bear, using his immense strength to prop up the collapsing structure, creating a pathway for everyone to escape. Meanwhile, Gugu desperately clings to the knocker creature, dangling precariously over the growing chasm. Luckily, strong arms grab him, pulling him back to safety. Realizing the danger Fusher is in, Gugu races towards the mansion. Inside the crumbling building, only Rin's injured parents remain. Without hesitation, Gugu heroically scoops them up and carries them out just as the mansion implodes in a cloud of dust. But before Rin can express her gratitude, Gugu charges back into the collapsing ruins, determined to help Fusher. He finds his friend back in his young boy form, facing off against the knocker in its true, monstrous form, a gigantic figure clad in impenetrable stone armor. Gugu's fire attack proves useless against the creature's defenses. The ground cracks open. They almost fall in, but Fusher uses his shape-shifting power to make a spear. He grabs Gugu and climbs to safety just in time. Together, they decide to fight the knocker. They search for a weak spot in the creature's rocky armor, hoping to find its core. Gugu finds a gap and blasts fire inside, setting the knocker on fire. It roars in defeat, and they celebrate their victory. But wait! The knocker isn't done yet. It charges back, this time killing Fusher, who was still in his giant bear form. Before it can attack Gugu, Rin jumps in and saves him. They run for their lives as Fusher shrinks back to his boy form. 
Suddenly, a sharp pain hits Fusher. He realizes Gugu is hurt, badly hurt. Gugu, trapped under a pile of rocks, had shielded Rin from the falling debris. He confesses his love for her through the pain, and Rin, crying, opens his mask and kisses him. Another, even stronger pain explodes inside Fusher. With a flash, he transforms into Gugu. But it's a trick. The real Gugu is gone, crushed by the rocks while protecting them. Filled with rage, Fusher attacks the knocker in Gugu's form, but it's useless. He falls into the water with the monster. The water sizzles and boils as it touches the red-hot knocker. Suddenly, the creature explodes in a massive blast. The force of the explosion rips knocker's armor apart, revealing its glowing core. But before anyone can celebrate, the core escapes, taking a part of Fusher with it. Gugu, now a spirit, sees a vision, a healed and happy version of himself, reunited with his brother and everyone else. He feels a surge of joy, but it's quickly replaced by a crushing realization. Everything was perfect until he misses his brother Fusher and realizes that he was actually dead. He then sees everyone gathered together, crying for him, and embraces his family. Fusher, unable to bear the thought of putting them in more danger, decides to leave. He entrusts Gugu's brother with the care of the store and sets off on his own. Rin wakes from her injury sustained at the party. Worried sick about Gugu, she rushes to the store. Fusher, unaware that Gugu's spirit is with him, sees her approaching. He panics, unsure how to explain his transformation back into a boy. On impulse, he transforms into Gugu. Relief washes over Rin, thrilled to see her friend alive. Fusher, his heart heavy with guilt, lies. He tells her Fusher is dead and leads her to Gugu's grave. Rin breaks down in tears, overwhelmed with grief. The old men arrive, providing Fusher with the perfect excuse to leave. Rin, wanting to remember him by, offers him back the ring she gave Gugu. Fusher, still in disguise, takes the ring, thanking her for keeping it. Later that night, surrounded by purple flowers, Rin confesses to her father that she can't get married, she loves someone else. Her father asks to meet him, but Rin, tears streaming down her face, reveals that he's gone. We understand then, Rin knows Gugu is dead, and a part of him lives on within Fusher. With a heavy heart, Fusher embarks on a new journey, seeking new experiences and carrying the memory of his friend.